Welcome back to another episode of The Scorekeepers. I'm your host, Daniel Farrell, and today I'm joined by composer Jason Brandt. His impressive body of work includes films like the upcoming Camp Hideout, starring Ethan Drew, Corbin Blue, and Christopher Lloyd, as well as the previously released Max Winslow and the House of Secrets, Freddy, and Christmas Wonderland. He's also contributed to popular television shows like Teen Titans Go, American Idol, The Bachelor, and many more. We're thrilled to be joined by Jason Brandt. Hey Jason, welcome to the show. Hey. It's great to have you here. Thanks, it's great to be here. So you have a new film releasing in theaters September 15th called Camp Hideout, and it's starring even Drew and Corbin Blue. Uh, congrats on this. Thanks. Can you tell us a little bit about the film? Sure. Camp Hideout is basically uh, two small-time crooks who end up hiring a teenager named Noah, and he steals a mysterious device, but the heist goes wrong, and he hides out in a summer camp, and that ends up changing his life. That's kind of the gist of it. Cool. So can you walk us through how you came to work on this project? Sure. I have a friend who is the director of the film. His name is Sean Robert Olson. Uh, we met back in the day at the University of Arizona, and uh, he and I have been working on a number of short films, and he's also an editor, and uh, I've also done a tiny bit of producing on the side for fun. And uh, we both end up moving from Arizona, late 90s, early 2000s, to Los Angeles. I ended up going to USC a little time after. We've just been working on each other's projects for so long that I finally got a chance to work on some of his feature films as well. And this is definitely uh, the best one so far. The last three have been so much fun. This has been a real thrill. It, it took a while to get onto this film. They had certain expectations of what they were going to do. And then we just kind of worked with it and overcame some obstacles. And it turned out great. Were you brought in like fairly early? like before they were filming or did you like come in right at the end? Usually I would be brought on earlier. This one, there's, I'm not sure why, it just took a little while to get hired on it just for sure. This was a different different group of directors and producers and stuff that uh, it just took a, little, a few minutes longer to do that. Uh, there was an interviewing process by, between myself and another composer. It's very talented and we ended up going uh, this direction. What can people expect from the score? Were there any kind of big inspirations that you drew on for the music for the film? In general, the way I approached writing the score, I knew I wanted to get inside the main character of Noah. He's the lead of the film. And he definitely thinks of himself as pretty cool and stealth. And I thought it would be fun to incorporate some retro 70s funk kind of like a soundtrack inside of his head anytime he does something cool. <laughs> I just wanted to reflect his sneakiness and outsmarting the criminals and the security guard and everyone else. And so there's different ways of approaching that in his psyche. Of There's even a superhero theme at a certain point when oh, the boys uh, as a group accomplish a uh, mission later in the movie. So uh, that was the first part of it. But then there's an emotional component, if you will, uh, to what everyone's journey is. And so I tend to go back and forth between uh, some of the funk ideas that's, you know, uh, bass, drums, guitar, and then uh, orchestral palette just to kind of really get in there. But then there's a lot of adventure where they're running around and they're sneaking around and they're you know, <laughs> tricking certain people and <laughs> getting away with murder. And <laughs> it did. It did give me kind of a c crazy like Home Alone vibes, you know, watching the trailer of just like definitely abusing these two crooks. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of fun in that. And just all those stunts that they end up doing in the end and then just all that running. It's <laughs> I was excited when you were coming down to compose the music for this. What is your starting point? Are you a, a person that like like you mentioned with the, the funk idea for his like inner thoughts or, or do you approach like the characters? Do you approach kind mm -hmm. of whatever the emotion of the scene is? How do you how do you start composing? Usually on the film, there's a temp track. And so that's the first idea that you kind of figure out, well, this is what everyone's thinking. And on this film, it was interesting because it was mostly orchestral throughout all the temp. Mm. And I thought that's where we were going. And uh, certainly when we were all the discussions, it started there. And I started that process of writing in that direction, but it didn't feel quite what it needed to be. And so uh, I ended up breaking it up a little bit more and finding a way to just kind of get in character for each one. I wanted this to feel a little more modern and just to move a certain way. And so it 
it certainly helped to go from different themes and different processes of it. But basically, I just start with, you know, uh, small sketches. And uh, sometimes I'll do it on piano. And then other times I will do it on keyboard. You know, if it's a more of an ambient score, uh, sometimes you need to find some pads in a certain palette to get there. But in this instance, we knew we knew we were definitely gonna have orchestra play some role of it. And uh, I knew I wanted to get a lot of uh, melody throughout, specifically when it's kids films and you're doing it. There's a lot of room for that. Uh, there's just more to play with, especially when they're running around and they're you know, <laughs> being silly and but then there's very heartfelt moments. And so there was a lot to catch, you know? And then the theme of the whole movie, it's a camp. You always have an acoustic guitar. Right, right. <laughs> At any given camp. And, you know, there's always some singing or whistling or a harmonica or clapping. And so I knew I wanted to approach and just add all those things that you would see on screen, but then also include it in the score. So, but I just didn't want there to be a boring moment at all. You know, anytime the kids are moving, then the score kind of goes with it too. Uh, it took a long time to just get all those themes, especially when we had one direction that we thought we were going to go in and then we're like, no, no, let's, let's experiment and then find our way through it. Yeah. I mean, it's cool that, you know, they had that direction and that you kind of went in this other one with the, these funk ideas yeah. and that. And just explore different ideas. And I think that probably is going to work out amazing. Yeah, I was really happy that Sean was completely open to that. We've worked on so many films and projects that we have a mental telepathy, if you will. <laughs> and uh, it's important to just go, OK, well, let's try something new and do this. And we're free to you know, say, you know, like he, he'll openly say that's not working. And I'll be like, OK, well, let's try a little <laughs> more of this, you know, a little more of that. And, you know, could it be faster, slower, bigger, smaller, you know, we'll you have to kind of uh, figure out, you know, what the director is looking for and how that works. And sometimes you figure it out when they love their temp track or if they don't love it. And then you can kind of go, well, where, where's the hitting? Where's it not? And then you kind of go from there. But it's, you know, you're almost like an armchair psychologist, if, if you will. Right. Yeah, I use that all the time <laughs> with, uh, with my own clients. I'm always like, you know, they always say composers were like your little therapist or you know, we're just going to mm -hmm. interpret whatever you say in music. Yeah, it takes uh, quite a bit of time to do that. And just to, because it's the subtext of the whole scene and you don't want to say too much, but then you don't want to say too little, uh, you know, but then it has another job, which is push the story forward. Because if you don't have any score, it just it's like the flattest thing you've ever seen. Oh, so. yeah. I don't think people realize until you strip away the music, like how much the music plays into the pacing of a film. And how Absolutely. much slower a film can feel when there's no music whatsoever. Yeah, it it's very dry and it doesn't say what you want it to say. It doesn't even it's it almost feels like a play or something. Mm. It's just a bunch of talking heads. But then when you have that music, it just brings it all together and it just tightens the screws a bit and just says, now we're going here, now we're going there. And it helps set up things and pay off others. And it just makes it feel a little more clever in some ways. You mentioned working with Sean Olson, the director on this film, and mm -hmm. you had collaborated him before. You mentioned a, a few films like Max Winslow and the House of Secrets, Christmas Wonderland, Freddy. Mm -hmm. How has yeah. your relationship with Sean, because you, you mentioned starting in college together, how has that kind of developed over the years working together? It was really interesting because when we started back at the University of Arizona, we had a bunch of filmmakers that we were working with. And I was writing music on a couple of other of his fellow director friends as well. And then as the years progressed, where some some films, he's just the editor and uh, or maybe he's a producer on something. But it's interesting to just kind of see the back and forth of it. We've had, uh, you know, some good experiences in Hollywood and not so good experiences. And it's important <laughs> that, you know, because, you know, everything has highs and lows. And especially when you're working with a lot of first time filmmakers, they it's different for everyone. Uh, sometimes, you know, they really trust you and other times they don't. You have to kind of prove yourself and prove those ideas. A lot of filmmakers, if they're lucky, they can, you know, in a career, they can do 10, 12 feature films. Whereas composers, you know, we can do many more than that. I mean, Ennio Morricone was well over 200, I think. Yeah, crazy, crazy. <laughs> or 400, number. I don't even know what the number is. It's insane how fast he wrote and how many things that he was a part of. But if you're a director, you're on it longer. So you're married to it a little longer. And so you have to gain that trust to go, okay, I, I know this is your baby. Uh, let me hold your baby. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to go skateboarding with it. And, but <laughs> I'll come right back. I promise. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, I've, uh, I've always said that 
like directors often, like you mentioned, they're editors or, or they're writers. They have mm-hmm. a lot of experience with the craft of filmmaking and they feel very confident speaking that language with all the other collaborators. And then they come to music and most of them have ne- never had any musical experience whatsoever. And you're hand, just like you said, you're handing their ba- the baby off to this composer and you're like, I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about music. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I, there's this old Frank Zappa quote about how I've, I want to, I'll mess this up, but something to the effect of uh, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Like, <laughs> like it just, it's very hard to verbalize you know, what you're looking for, you could say, I want happy or I want sad. But then, you know, you listen to someone like Thomas Newman, he's got a couple of feelings in one cue. It's like melancholy here, but hopeful, but bittersweet, you know, and film music can do that. And the way that blends in, how do you verbalize that? You know, you really have to have a conversation of go, well, how do you feel? What is this saying? And at some point, you know, you're handing it off to someone who speaks a completely different language than you. You know, because they you're right, they absolutely have a good idea of the color correction and the sound design and the cinematography for sure. And then the editing and then casting all these choices they're really good at. But when you get to the music, it's just hard to talk about it. And I found that some of the best directors, are the ones that do collect soundtracks and sometimes have temps with it and played with temps and they're like, oh, wow, that music changes mm-hmm. the whole thing. You know, you put a horror cue in there. And it really darkens it. And it's the same piece of footage that you're watching. And then you put a love theme under it. And you're like, oh, I'm falling in love with them. Like it can color it that much. And sometimes I've you know, had to play with temp music in front of them and go, just try this. Like, what do you think? Is that too much, too little? It's like going to an optometrist and going, number one, number two. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, you know, we are telling stories through music. And it's very important to get inside their head. And they've lived with that story for so long. You want to get that right. You want to tell the story correctly. And uh, hopefully you can. So I know that some of your earliest kind of musical involvements were in school was in rock and jazz. And you mentioned, obviously, like the, the funk music for this internal kind of monologue of the character. Was there other ways in which you kind of drew on your your earliest experiences with music for the score? Absolutely. Uh, When I was a kid, I started off on classical piano and then I just didn't, it didn't fully connect with it. I ended up circling back to that in college, but I definitely was a fan of uh, guitar players in general. I mean, every, you know, Eddie Van Halen was a big deal, Metallica, Led Zeppelin, all of that. And that's kind of where I was like, oh, look at right. all that dexterity. And some of those guitar players are virtuosos like Steve. I, I mean, our listeners can't can't see this, but you have like three, four yeah, guitars. It's in the insane. <laughs> There's tons thing. here and more. I'll, I'll have to shovel it around so you can see it. But uh, I have a I do have a bit of a problem. I could have an intervention with how many guitars I have. People always ask, how many do you have? And I only commit to 10, but it's Oh, it's it's gear acquisition syndrome. That's what it is. You just it is. I mean, you need choices. (laughs) You know, that's why you keep getting another string library and then another, you know, choral library or whatever. You just need choices. But with (laughs) guitars, it's like, well, this pickup's a little different than that one, so I need a whole new guitar. (laughs) And then you lie to yourself. It's a tax (laughs) write-off. So uh, yeah, I went through that phase of you know wanting to be the rock star and all that and. Somewhere in there, I remember uh, my trajectory had really changed when I had discovered film music. Uh, I was reading a lot of books and then listening. I was starting to collect. Uh, I don't know if you remember a movie called Dance with Wolves, mm-hmm. Silence of the Lambs, uh, Empire Strikes Back. All of these were soundtracks that I would listen to in the background while uh, reading books. But sometimes I'd have to put the book down and go, what was that? Like That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. That's really interesting because... You know, when you're writing for media, there's way more opportunity to switch up styles. And I just can't imagine just playing rock guitar or metal guitar for the rest of my life. That one thing, you know, it's important to stretch. Every artist is interested in multiple styles of music, and it's always exciting. The discovery process is like heroin. Not that I've had heroin, but I'm just saying that, you know, it's very addictive. When you're like, I just heard something new and I love it and I want to hear more of it and more of it. I can lose way too much time on iTunes and YouTube just discovering new sounds and new composers. And I mean, it's just very exciting. So I, I started in that process and decided to go, you know, to kind of leave the rock thing. But it's still in the back of my mind. You know, every style of music 
is on the table when you're writing a score. Like, you know, how could you do it? If I did ragtime in the middle of this, is that a choice? I mean, it is. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, you know, you could do, you know, gospel piano here or big band, you know, funk in this instance. Or, you know, sometimes it's funny just to have a, a classic superhero theme in the middle of one little cue mm -hmm. when everyone's like, yeah, we did it. You know, and it's like, <laughs> okay, cool. And then go right back to, you know, a whistling theme with, you know, three whistling while, you know, he's saluting a flag. And right. <laughs> film music is interesting because it's one of those rare occupations where you draw on everything that you've heard your mm -hmm. entire life. You know, you heard something when you were in third grade and then you heard something when you were in college and then you heard something, you know, two hours ago and you're like, all of this I could use somewhere. And I feel like there's no bad music. There's just choices. Well, I'm not worried about AI as much, you know, and some of these others because we're human beings that just need to express ourselves reaching out to other human beings in other ways of doing it. So it's been a long journey, but it's been a fun journey. And I'm always curious about, you know, new music and different styles and different recording processes as well. It's always interesting to hear how, you know, Beyonce records an album and Katy Perry, but then you listen to, you know, Stravinsky, you know, how are they, that's a very dynamic, you know, if you're listening to Rite of Spring, there's a lot of quiet dynamics right. and then very loud. And how do you even record that? But then how do you make it punchy? And all that's part of the storytelling process. And it's, you know, it's almost as mm -hmm. important as the composition pro process, especially when they're hearing it, your director's hearing it and the producer's hearing it for the first time because it's all in how they respond to it and helps the story. What was the producing and recording process like for the score for Camp Haida? Did you record locally, remotely? There's a lot of uh, uh, in the box live musicians. Can you just talk about it? Yeah, I did a ton of live guitars, ton of live piano, a lot of bass, uh, other instruments like that. Some of this was definitely in the box for sure. And I am recording and uh, producing at the same time so we can you know, meet deadlines so they can hear it. Anytime I send a demo out, I try to make it as polished as possible because I don't want them being distracted by the thing that's going to be right later because you know we discussed earlier it's just hard to talk about music and it's hard to say well that's going to sound better eventually i mean <laughs> right. i understand that they do that with pre, you know pre-visualization like here's a storyboard a real actor is coming in this instance you know like this midi thing will sound way better just throw some money on it and you know that's it's hard to get them to pre-visualize that and so it's important that you give the most polished version of it with the best samples. And especially if I'm performing guitar, I'm going to make it the best sounding thing. And that's usually the stuff that gets approved. And then we can move on. Otherwise, it's a guessing game like, OK, so you didn't like the cue or you didn't like the sound of the cue or you didn't like right. the recording. I'm all in at the same time, just you know, high quality so they know this is what it's going to sound like later. And if it is going to sound different, you know, like it's a hundred piece choir, then that's a conversation like ready. All right. Remember before you hear this, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tricky. Cause like you mentioned, they're so used to storyboards and things like that, where they, you know, filmmakers have to use your visual imagination, but when they get into that sonic imagination, it's not quite there. And you really yeah, it's have more to challenging. be like, I promise, I promise, I promise this will <laughs> sound better. I promise to sprinkle magic right through here at this key point when we get that player, you know, it will happen. We're bringing it, but you know, that's the, the conversation it has to happen. You have to build trust at all times and just go, look, it's your story. How can I help you get there? Right. And you know, that trust doesn't come quickly mm -hmm. and sometimes you get it. Sometimes you don't, uh, you know, but with best intentions and long conversations, you know, you can get there. So switching gears a little bit, you were a longtime composer for the show Teen Titans Go. Sure, I'm still doing it. And a few years ago, as the composer for the show Crime Watch Daily with Chris Hansen. So obviously two totally different <laughs> shows tonally, right? Yeah. But what was it like composing mm -hmm. for television as opposed for, for film? Uh, it's a completely different animal. I do love television a lot. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, and I, I saw this interview with famous actor Chris Hartnett, I think that's who it was. He was talking about how every time you do a movie, it's like they're building a whole new business. So there's a new business model from film to film to film. But when you're on a TV show, it's kind of already set. And sometimes you go from, step, you know, obviously episode to episode, that's all the same team that knows we're doing this. And a lot of times that team is going to the next show. 
that's a different thing. And so some of these shows are connected and some aren't, but they're all kind of understanding. So I've noticed that uh, you have to really build the trust more with filmmakers when you're going from project to project to project, especially if they're first time. But on television, it's a blast. I mean, I love writing. <laughs> Crime Watch Daily is amazing because it's very gritty. And a lot of murder in that, a lot of death. You know, a lot of, you know, uh oh, this person's innocent or are they? There's so much fun in that. And so I, in that show, I remember working a lot with ambience and pulse mm -hmm. and different ways of attacking it. Uh, I've had a couple of movies. I remember I did one with Danny Trejo and it was gritty and you needed a lot of different choices. You didn't want anyone's ear to get tired. You wanted to keep the story going. But how do you do that with just pads? That was a real, I mean, I had maybe two or 300 different sounds happening you know from scene to scene just to make it happen without melody without you right. know because it's a different now animal when you have an orchestra you can take that melody and then make it major or minor and twist it and turn it and you that's a different way to go about it but when you're going from a show like teen titans go which is very vibrant very fast very fun and then you go to crime watch daily you know that's <laughs> <laughs> just a fun all i can say is it's fun and i love that challenge and it's why I'm not a rock guitar player trying to tour. It's because I love variety and trying new things with different palettes. And that's a good chance to do discovery and, you know, listen to other composers and go, well, what are they doing? How mm. would they approach it? You know, how did Ennio Morricone do this kind of thing all those years ago? And then how would Trent Reznor approach that, you know, 10 years ago? All of that's really interesting to me. So for Teen Titans Go, I know that there was quite a few composers that were all working on it, mm -hmm. uh, well, are all working yep. on it currently. It's still going on. It's crazy. I was looking at IMDb 10 years that show's been going on. Yeah, I remember when we started, or yeah, I guess it was 2013, and they weren't sure what it was going to be. They didn't know if it was, they thought they were just going to break even with it. And uh, after about a year or two, they're like, oh, this is great. And I remember going to like McDonald's or Wendy's and they had a promo. I was like, oh, they're fine. <laughs> you know, and now I have Funko Pops and I have all the stuff. And yeah, it's, they're totally fine. There's a huge amount of composers. Was there a lot of collaboration? Did you work with them? Is in some instances, yes. In some instances, no. Uh, a lot of times you would get the scenes uh, and you would get to compose two pictures. Other times it was blind. Mm. They would just say, we want this kind of thing. And you would go with it. I remember there was one episode. Oh, it was like a retro video game. Uh, you know, so I got to do a bunch of kind of 80s inspired video games that were with the 8-bit sounds. That was new for me, but I love the challenge. I mean, you know, to listen to Spy Hunter and hear, you know, dun 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 Fascinating to just hear what they were doing. And, you know, it's still based on like a pentatonic scale or a blue scale with a very cool groove. and <laughs> You know, and then you just orchestrate it with other sounds that are mono. And it's a fun... Just looking for those sounds, I, w I think I was using Reason. I forget. There's a bunch of programs that I was using at the time. And just kind of finding how they did that because uh, it gives you a chance to go back into the 80s. And how did that composer do that? Because if you're listening to uh, Mario Brothers, that's just a couple of melodies happening at once. It's, they're not doing right. chords so much. It's two moving parts. I love doing research on that and getting to incorporate that. But that show just moves. I mean, they just have funny, zany things real fast. And then it stops. And then they do some talking head stuff or, you know, just dialogue between them and then back and forth. So there was another show I did right around that uh, time. It was called Mike Tyson Mysteries. And mm. that was also had a similar kind of thing, but uh, they went a little further. I remember a couple of seasons in, they had a show that was called Jason B. Sucks. I was so scared. I was like, what does that mean? Because I'm Jason B. <laughs> and I had to watch that episode because I didn't know if they were playing a joke on me. And they weren't. And just see, so the episode was about some guy in Nevada named Jason B. who left a bad review of their uh, research team or their mystery skills. And so they had to go and confront that guy and his name was Jason B. I was like, phew, they're not talking about me. Whew. Yeah. And I was like, good. I thought that was funny. So. So you mentioned in, in Camp Hideout all the different musical styles mm -hmm. and, and you jumping from different you know, genre to genre and pulling all these things out of your kind of toolbox of music. And I'm sure you had to do the same thing in, in Teen Titans Go as well, just jumping mm -hmm. between all these different styles. Do you 
do you kind of have a process for that? Do you like, I'm going to write this kind of music this day, or is it hard to kind of reframe for different styles? How do you kind of approach that? It's interesting. I'm huge on figuring out the tone of the film right from the get-go. And part of that is also picking sounds. Like uh, sometimes I'll just, you know, write down a piece of paper, the ensembles that I think would fit well uh, while I'm doing it. Sometimes I don't even turn the computer around. I'm just writing down on a notepad and then maybe going to a piano and working some things out. I like to take my iPhone and hit the reverse video and just record me playing a few things and just sketching like that so I can improvise. I'm not even touching a computer. I, sometimes that's freeing. Because, you know, I, I came up through more mm. acoustic sounding instruments and it's just important to do that. So I will do a lot of sketching. I'm a huge fan of writing 20, 30 seconds of anything and then making choices and going, oh, that works. Oh, that totally doesn't. And uh, I always think everything's brilliant on the day I write it. And then the following day, I'm like, not so much. <laughs> it's true. I'm always humbled by future me. Future me is like, what do you really you thought that was good? Right. What was, that was that? Uh, you, and but maybe that second day was like, well, let's just add to yesterday's Jason and put another melody in there, another theme, switch out that sound. But I'm a huge fan of just doing a series of sketches to you know figure out different character themes, and especially the beginning of it. I mean, I love opening titles. I love watching the opening movie. Just the beginning of it is always telling. Some composers handle that really, really well, especially back in the day. I mean between John Williams, Danny Elfman, Thomas Newman, they just capture that tone and they twist and turn and they're like chameleons in that regard. I've always been a fan of guys that can do that and uh, especially mm. uh, Jer uh, Jerry Goldsmith was another one that I admired a, a great deal just in how they twisted and turned and got into that. But that's generally it. I will either sit down, depending on how melodic the score is, I'll usually sit down at a piano and plunk it out and have some ideas Maybe I'll listen to other soundtracks that I loved as a youth. I mean, I feel like everyone's chasing their childhood at some point. You know, when you're a kid, what made you go, oh, I'm going to do this? You right. know? Steven Spielberg is still exciting now, even though, you know, his movies are different than they were in the 80s and the mm -hmm. 90s. He's still very, very exciting. Same thing with, you know, early Star Wars stuff. And I still connect with some of that more. But, you know, it's fun to just listen to stuff and go, well, what speaks to you now? And I sometimes have to ask myself, well, why is that working? Why is that not? I don't know. I, I just love that research process. So I, I sometimes will just, you know, listen to the lay of the land and then go back in time and like, did we do it better back in the day? And it's just important to, you know, do that and then start writing sketches on that feeling. And then, of course, you bring in a director and go, what do you think of this? And put it to picture and, you know, I'll sync it up to the quick time email that to him and then what are your thoughts? You know, cause it's a collaboration. That's what makes it fun. And you are telling stories. Right. So it's, you know, in music. So it's important mm -hmm. to really talk that out. And just, I, just, I love having them in the room and you can see it in their body language. Like they get a tense up and you can either say, oh, oh, that's, I'm never playing that again. Just hit delete. Right. They're squirming going, oh, this guy's killing it. He's <laughs> murdering my baby. Them. Like, what are you, what are you thinking? Yeah, immediately. That's a bit of the process, how I approach it. So I just wanted to end with, because I think this is a fun question to ask folks, but if you could go back 10 years or so, what is one piece of advice you would give to your younger self? I have lots of advice. In general, I would say take bigger risk. Don't just stick with what you know. Stick with what you don't know. You know, take some risks and uh, you know, go for the project that you, you're scared of. I think it's okay to be afraid. I think it's okay to go, I don't know if I'm the right person for this, but I'm going to go for it anyways and really reach hard for it. And saying no at the same time. There are lots of projects where I remember there's a couple of shows that maybe I just shouldn't have done because uh, it worn tore on my soul. Mm. Uh, the most power you're ever going to have is saying the word no. And you should say it because uh, once you say yes, <laughs> you're in until the deadline's over. And maybe you regret it, maybe you don't. But I've, that's one of those things. And I also wish I did do an apprenticeship for six months at maybe Han, with Hans Zimmer or some famous composer just to see how they do it, how they approach it, to see some of those meetings and how they run a recording session. I took a different route. I had opportunity to write for film and television pretty quickly. And I was able to put food on the table and 
transition out of a day job into doing that pretty quickly. I was very fortunate. So I kind of missed that. I thought, oh, I don't want to do that because I don't want to be someone's assistant forever because that that can't last forever. You got to start building relationships immediately. That would be right. kind of it is just taking bigger risk and then making sure you're taking care of everything that you think you need to take care of in your life. Because there was a window of time where you know someone would be like, hey, uh, what's going on in your life? And I'd be like, well, I'm on this film and this film and this film and this show and this show. But I wasn't really living life. And now I'm married with kids and I'm fitting all that in while writing music for a living. And it's much richer now than it was in the first five years of my career in Hollywood. For the first couple of years, you are hustling. You are you know, really doing it. But I did wear myself out around five years in and I had to take a break and I realized, oh, I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> so you should say no. And then for things that look really exciting, go all in and reach out and embarrass yourself if you have to. But it doesn't make a difference. People love passion. If you're really excited and you're like, I want to be a part of what you're doing, you you should do that yeah. and say it out loud. Yeah, brilliant advice, I think, for anybody pursuing film music. Oh, thank you. <laughs> great. <laughs> Been a great talking to you about your process and how you came up through music and oh, thanks. all these little insights into how you've done the music for Camp Hideout, which of course is in theater September 15th. I'm going to say it again for everybody to go and mm -hmm. see it. And this episode should be dropping the week of that premiere. So Ooh, make sure nice. you go see it. Listen carefully for that superhero theme and the <laughs> the middle of the, the film. <laughs> yeah, it's been great speaking to you, Jason. It's been an honor to speak to you. Thank you for uh, inviting me on this. I'm, I'm really thankful that I got to be a part of this. So thank you. It was wonderful listening to Jason discuss his creative process and inspirations for his musical score to Camp Hideout. Be sure to check out Camp Hideout in theaters this Friday, September 15th. Thanks for listening to The Scorekeepers. The Scorekeepers is produced by Daniel Farrell Music and Sound with graphic and visual design by Patrick Farrell. Scorekeepers is proudly hosted and recorded using Zencaster. Make sure you subscribe to hear new episodes of The Scorekeepers wherever you listen. And be sure to rate and review this episode to help us find new listeners. Thanks for listening.